Cool. So welcome to the Rise of the Super Bean podcast. I'm Vanderson Pires, your host. Our producer is Callan Walker. And today our guest is Dogo Sunderland. And we're going to talk about uh, something really, really interesting. So before we get into, um, remember this episode is sponsored by Combat Room. So if you want to learn Jiu-Jitsu, come to see me and my team at www.combatroom.co.nz. So, Dugo, thank you so much for your time. Cool. It's a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great yeah. to be here. Cool. <laughs> really nice. And it was super cool because you you choose a really interesting subject. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about the the Tifa, Tifari Tapa Fa. Right? Boom. That's the one. Yes. Yep. That's not Brazilian, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, super cool. Yeah. So, so before before getting into to the subject, so yep. let's talk a little bit about you know your you've been psychology for over twenty years. Yeah, right. No. It's a, it's a long time. You're a black is. belt in psychology. Yeah. yeah, and I'm only thirty five. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, I started really young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is it is a long time when especially when you say it like that. Um, mm. Yeah, but it's ve uh, like it's it's a varied career. I've been wor I've worked in. DHBs like public, you know, health settings, and for the past six years I've worked at um, Victoria University in Wellington, and working for a group called Umbrella Health. Um, so I think one of the beauties about our profession is that you can move around. That you go, oh, I don't really want to work in that area anymore. I'm going to work in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly in the last probably five years, maybe a little bit longer, there's been a tremendous growth. Just I think in public interest in psychology mm -hmm. and these sort of tremendous amount of um, areas that have suddenly opened up. So it's like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, so it's good. It's good to be able to share that with students. You know, they say, Oh, do you think there'll be a job at the end of it? And I say, I'm pretty sure there's quite a few jobs at the end of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, but yeah, but yeah, 20 years is, is, it does sound, makes me sound old, doesn't it? But, no, <laughs> it sounds, sounds experience. Oh yeah. yeah. No, it's an experience. That's it. Yeah. Good. Nice. So Dugo, how, how did you start in psychology? Well, Oh, okay. Um, so I started because one of my teachers lied to me. Um, uh. <laughs> so I was in high school um, and I had a great teacher, Peter McHugh, actually, and I don't, don't even know what's become of him. Mm. Um, but he was quite an inspirational teacher. He had a passion for for people and for mm. psychology. But, he, t he, but you know, he said all these things, which once you get to university, you find out, that's not true at all. You know, things <laughs> like, did you know that you only use 10% of your brain? And yeah. I'm going, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, everybody's going, well, what do you use the other 90% for? It's not just sitting there. So, 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 but he got me interested, I think, in thinking about psychology, because of course you can't, well, in my day anyway, you couldn't do it at school. Mm -hmm. So it was this whole unknown. Um, so I went to uni, I went to Otago Uni down in Dunedin, um, and I actually went to be a lawyer, um, mm. so that was my that was my goal, 1980s, I'd, well just, so I wasn't at uni in the 1980s, I grew up in the 1980s, uh. and there was LA Law and all those programs, it was like, yeah, I'm going to be a lawyer, and I got to uni, and I did law, and I did psychology on the side, so I was doing a double degree in psychology, and the more I did psych, I went, oh, this is quite cool, I kind of like this, but I'm still going to be a lawyer, mm -hmm. and then sort of three or four years into it, I went, mm, I don't really like the law anymore i'm sure the <laughs> yeah. sure the there are really lots of great lawyers yeah. um but i'm not going to be one of them uh and i was getting better I was, and i was i was i was enjoying psychology and but i didn't think you could do anything with it mm. i thought that was just it and then i found this thing called clinical psychology which was um because people often say well how does that differ from other psychology so and clinical psychology was like ah oh, this is actually where you get to put all the building blocks of learning that you've been doing and put them together to help people mm. and i had a and I, that had got me into law in the first place i'd sort of wanted had a desire to give back to people and to help them and i just didn't feel that that uh, need was going to be met in law but that i could see a really clear path for it in psychology so then into psychology and and off we went and I never looked back really so mm -hmm. but that was um well that would have been that would have been close to 30 years ago that I did that so mm -hmm. I started at uni in the early 1990s but yeah so it was it was it was that really interest and and finding your passion I think and I, I think I found that with psychology mm -hmm. so psychologists it's what's your passion about it of course yeah, I well one of your passions. One one of my passions. I think the passion really that I have is the 
passion for meeting people and talking with them and i and mm-hmm. and, and often students when we're training them say oh, why you know what's what do you think is the best thing about clinical psychology and for me it's that the tremendous um, privilege I guess that you get from being able to listen to somebody's intimate story and for them to tell you about their life and really what's going on because we spend you know most of our time really not telling each other what we're thinking and what we're feeling Mm -hmm. Um, some of the times because it would be bloody embarrassing you know I don't want everybody to know what I'm thinking or feeling (laughs) Um, so you don't we don't tell each other that so then you get into this very privileged um position where people tell you things that they possibly have never told anybody else and you've got the opportunity to help them so Mm -hmm. it's 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 uh, so I I think that's my passion is that opportunity to 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 assist people and I've found this tool that I'm good at which is psychology to be able to help people because I think we all and and I guess this is clearer since I've gotten older that that we all suffer from something Mm -hmm. that nobody has a perfect life um and the more i understand about me and the people around me the more i go oh i thought you really had it together but actually you you, not you (laughs) i'm sure vanderson you've got it Uh, (laughs) you haven't got it together um (laughs) and you know and then you go oh but but if, if none of us have got it together then surely isn't that a unifying thing, can't we? Yes. So, so I, I, I think that's my passion is that that humanity of it. It's like, ah, man, we all suffer, we all struggle, we're all humans, mm-hmm. and w- wouldn't it be good to, isn't it good to be able to help each other in that journey? That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, I love, yeah. I love that. I love cool. that. Yeah, so in the umbrella, umbrella health as mm-hmm. well, so you, you're part of, of that. So, so tell a little bit about what, what's, yeah. what's, what's that's about it. Yeah, so I, I wear two hats. I wear my Victoria University teaching students how to be clinical psychologists hat and I wear my Umbrella Health hat. Mm-hmm. And Umbrella is a group of clinical psychologists and we do um, mental health awareness and resilience, mental resilience training for workplaces and um, yeah, predominantly for workplaces. And we do those for government departments or private organisations Um um, throughout New Zealand and internationally as well. So that's it's, it's helping people understand. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's being able to provide employees or, or workers, if you like, mm-hmm. with psychological tools. But the great thing about it is they don't have to pay for it because their organisation pays for it. Because mm-hmm. organisations have realised in the past 10 years when they've looked at the research that actually if they have help, healthy, happy psychologically well-adjusted employees, lo and behold, they have happy workplaces and happy workplaces yes. are better workplaces and they produce more. Mm. Um, so so, so um, organisations have and companies have gone, oh, I think, I think we should be looking after our, the, the mental well-being of our clients. Yeah. And particularly in New Zealand, I think since uh, there was a legislation change in 2015 around health and safety in the workplace. Mm-hmm. And it said... Um, it doesn't say exactly this because it wouldn't be very good law if it just said this, but it mm. says basically uh, you have to look after your your employees' mental health. So in the past, health and safety had been around physical health largely. Do you have a handrail on your stairs? Do you put up one of those little triangular signs when you've got a wet floor? Mm-hmm. That's health and safety. But 2015, they said, nope, it includes mental health. And a whole lot of organisations went, what? The heck? what? Yeah. Mental what? How the hell do we do that? Yeah. And so, so the work for Umbrella is just mushroomed. So we do, um, we do a huge range of organisations um, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade to uh, I did a workshop with in, during lockdown with Hamilton Jets in Christchurch who make jet boat engines. Mm-hmm. So you get all this huge variety of people. Um, but I love it because of that you're hit it really being able to um, to talk to a lot of people at once rather than just one to one, which is traditional psychology. You just talk one to one, and that's cool. You make a difference to that one person. But what if you could make a difference to like twenty or thirty people at once? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's umbrella, and it's it's um, it's it's really taken off in the last few years, and and sort of we've we had a massive growth uh and work over lockdown as well so um doing lots of zoom sessions for employees and doing them around the world um so yeah i've done workshops 
everywhere from China to Saudi Arabia to South Korea, Australia. Wow, and that's Zealand. amazing. So it's kind of like, whoa, who ever thought you'd get to travel? I went yeah. to Papua New Guinea, which I wouldn't recommend. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> uh, I, got, I got a bit freaked out before I went there because I, I had to have a security briefing for a start and the guy sat down with me and he said, now, just so you know, Port Moresby, it's our, is it, is it our, yeah, it's our most dangerous place that we've got to post in the world. And I was going, <laughs> Okay, um, so I'm going here. I'm good. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so he says, so if you if if somebody appears, uh, you always stay in the car unless they've got a rock or a gun. In which case, they're going to get in anyway. So then make sure you get out of the car. <laughs> I was going, like, all right, and here's a secret number. Put that in your shoe so that if you get mugged, uh, you can phone that number. It's like, okay. okay. <laughs> so anyway, I don't recommend going to Port Moors. I'm sure it's a very nice place, but it's, yep, lawlessness abound. So, but anyway, yeah. Uh-huh. So I've, I've, I've delivered all sorts of workshops to all sorts of people in all sorts of places, which is which is pretty cool, really. Mm, that's awesome. So, Dougal, do you think the um, mental health is still surrounded by lots of stigma look i th- I, th- I think it is but i mm. think it's improving i think people you know and there's been lots of you know campaigns around that you know john kerwin's done lots around that mike king has done lots around that and mm. and what what i am really heartened by when i talk to students um is that they i think there's a generational shift coming mm-hmm. like people like you and i who are over 35 yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we, we might have grown up in an era where you don't really talk about it very yeah, much, but yeah. the, the, the sort of the new generation coming through, so people that are starting to hit university now, they just talk about mental health all the time, just like it's mm-hmm. like it's normal, and that's how it should be, right? Yeah, it's just the same as our physical health. If I had a sore knee, I would have no problem about saying to you, "Oh, I got a sore knee. Oh, mm. what did you do to it? Oh, you know." broke my meniscus joint or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we don't say that about mental health. Well, we haven't until now said that. But but really young people coming through, I think, have really have grown up in a, in a, in a climate where they're more comfortable talking about it. So there's, I, I think there's still stigma, especially for sort of, you know, older people, you know, 50s and older, because they, they've grown up in that, in that where we don't talk about feelings, we don't talk about what we're thinking, it's all weird, stuff it down like a sock into a shoe, don't, yeah. stuff, don't talk about it for God's sake. <laughs> but, you know, a new so, generation yeah. coming through is, is way more open, which is really encouraging. So, mm-hmm. And I think, you know, things like this, podcasts like this, can be really great about just, again, reducing that stigma. Let's just talk about it. It's all right. Yeah. It's not the end of the world. Mm-hmm. We're, we've all got brains. We all suffer a bit. Yeah. Um, we all have a whole range of emotions, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. And also, I think, you know, we, we need to understand suffering. You no, know, my suffering is not bigger or smaller than your suffering. You no know, suffering, yeah, yeah. we cannot put a quantity on that. No, you know, no. But we all have, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Abs- yeah, it's a very uniting thing, isn't it, when you realize, actually, I suffer like this, you suffer like that, um, and, and we all as humans suffer. Mm-hmm. Um and and isn't it good that if we can join together and support each other through as to find a pathway out of that suffering? But actually, it's part of our existence, part of our life. Isn't yeah. It? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's awesome. That's amazing. And so, Dogo, let's let's talk a little bit about you know the the team we you know you you choose it to you know to to teach us some some information. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So Tefari Tapa Fa. So. Tell me a little bit about uh, about that. Even for the people who is from, it's not from New Zealand. Yeah, listen yeah, yeah. to this podcast. Yeah. So please, can you? Yeah, yeah, cool. Can you give a good Absolutely. introduction to us? Well, I hope so. I hope I can yeah. do justice. <laughs> um, so it's Fari Tapa Fa. It's it's a Māori model of 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 health, and it came. I think it was. Well, it was really put together in the in the 1980s, but I'm guessing that if you spoke to somebody that was an expert in Māori health, and I'm not an expert in Māori health, they would say, look, this is actually stuff that we have known as Māori for for hundreds of years. Mm-hmm. And so it's not it's not new, but we've just put this fancy framework around it. And literally translated to whare tapawha means the four walls of a house. And the idea is that f- to have a good, solid... Um, well-functioning house or meeting house, you want four strong walls, mm-hmm. and for for us as humans, we want four strong areas of 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 functioning in our life. So we we need to have um, we need to be strong or, or or doing well in our physical health, mm-hmm. in our mental and emotional health, in our in our family or our relationship health, and in our spiritual health as well. And and I it's uh, we we. I wouldn't say that I'm teaching to Fari Tapafa as a model because per se, because that's a Māori model and I'm not Māori. But I, I, I guess what I would say is I am sort of 
inspired by that model and can and think that as psychologists we've got bits to contribute to each of those four walls so the physical health the mental health the emotion the um, spiritual health and the social health and as psychologists we can we know we know a little bit about lots of of those areas that we can hopefully help people in their lives and you know really function together holistically as a person Mm -hmm. that's beautiful i love that so let's let's talk about those those four four areas mm-hmm. as well. So so let's start with the so the mental well being. Okay, all right. Well, so that's that would be like probably a, my sort of particular area, right? Being a psychologist. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I think. Hmm. Th- yeah, I, I. It's such a vast area, I guess, in a way, isn't it? But I think that the if I was to th- think about my top two or three things that I. Th- think people should do for good mental well-being Mm -hmm. i think it's really important to build into your life a ritual or a routine around being able to stop and simply almost do a stock take on your your emotional state and your mental state Uh, and there are probably lots of ways of doing that Um, i think a really good way of doing that is through using mindfulness Mm -hmm. Um, and 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 it's probably worth spending a little time explaining what mindfulness is because it I know it get, it's a term that gets used a lot and all the time, and people have different um, different understandings of it. Mm-hmm. So for me, mindfulness, the best definition is um, uh, non-judgmental awareness of the present moment, and particularly awareness of your inner landscape, if you like. So what am I thinking and what am I feeling? But getting into that by really becoming aware of your physical body sensation so so being able to sit for 20 minutes or so and notice actually what is what what's the physical sensation in my foot what's the physical sensation in my knee what's the physical sensation in my chest and just attuning to that and if I notice an emotion that's cool and what's the physical sensation that goes with it um, and so using those physical sensations as the very early warnings, well, not warning signs, but the very early signs of uh, noticing what you're thinking and your, and your feeling. Um, and, I th- you know, a, lo- a lot of people would say that in the Western world we have, we spend a lot of time in our heads, a lot of times thinking and a lot of times mm. doing. Um, and mindfulness is really helpful for, uh, getting out of our heads and into our hearts a bit more and, and for for stopping doing things and just being for a moment. Um, I heard a really great, great quote. I can't remember who said I can never remember who said great quote, so I sort of, <laughs> I just say that they're mine. Yeah. Um, but, but somebody else, not me, said, uh, mindfulness is really useful because it helps you tune into your body when it's whispering so that it doesn't have to scream to get your attention. Wow. And, and I thought, oh, that's really mm-hmm. such a really good description. So, mm-hmm. so in terms of mental health, I really would encourage people to have the practice of sitting. Ideally, it would be every day and simply becoming aware and aware of where your thoughts are, aware of where your emotions are, aware of where your physical sensations are. Um, and people often say, well, how do you do? How do you do that? And the answer is, you know, in the modern day, just get an app. Get an, I, I use an app for mindfulness. I've, yeah, yeah. Put an, I've got a couple. Mm-hmm. Um, Which ones? Uh, so I use oh, yeah, that one. Uh, uh-huh. What do I use? <laughs> well, I use this one. I'm uh-huh. pulling out my phone because yes. I need to look at it to actually tell you what it is called. It mm-hmm. is called Open Ground. Mm. Uh, and it's an Australian one, and I used it because I've just finished it. Well, I finished in lockdown doing a, how long was it? An eight-week um, mindfulness course online, mm-hmm. and that an open ground ran it. So open ground, open uh, ground. That's cool. Um, so you can use open ground. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a, a mindfulness course at Oxford University, and they have released a just a series of um, of mindfulness meditation exercises, which are on um, Spotify. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like okay. So sometimes I use those, but. Um, yeah, it's nice. So, so I think having somebody guiding you through it uh, is really helpful when you start learning. Um, after a while, you probably actually want to dispense with somebody talking because it gets kind of annoying. Uh-huh. And so, one for example, one of the um, Oxford ones is actually just white noise with bells every five minutes, just so you can keep track of time. So you know, the, the, it's just 
mm. and then dong, and the and the white noise just cancels itself out really. So you just mm. become immersed in your inner landscape for a while. You notice where your thoughts are going. And I think the other great thing about mindfulness is is that well, there are a couple of great things. One is the non judgmental component. Mm -hmm. So you learn to notice when judgments are arising about yourself. Oh, I notice having that feeling, that physical sensation. I don't like that, and I try to move to get away from it. And mindfulness would say, well, just you don't need necessarily to move. Just notice it, mm -hmm. and and experience that. Um, and then that expands into, well, I noticed that unpleasant thought and I noticed trying to think about something else really quickly. Do you know what? It, it's okay. Just notice the thought. Yeah. And notice the thought arise and notice the thought pass away. Um, oh, I have this really unpleasant emotion. God, I'm feeling really guilty. I'm feeling really angry. And I try to do something with those because I don't like having those feelings. Mm -hmm. Actually, they're all just normal feelings. And I just allowing myself to sit with that letting it peak which can be a bit freaky and then come down the other side again and becoming aware that your emotions and your thinking um, will come and go like waves and we don't necessarily have to resp respond to those that we often we're drawn into automatically reacting to those um, and we behave in a certain way because we've had this thought or this feeling and but actually, we don't have to respond. We can choose if we want to respond. And so I think that's a really useful thing about mindfulness is that ability to to, to experience things without judging, so developing self-compassion, um, and the ability to choose how you want to respond. Um, and I really like the compassion element that comes from the non-judgment because we know that um, the psychological literature tells us that if you are compassionate towards yourself, it's more easy to be compassionate towards another person, but that it's more yes. difficult to be compassionate towards another person if you are not compassionate towards yourself. Ah, I'm so glad you said that. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. and it's a challenge, eh? Because often people will say, oh, yeah, I can be kind to my neighbor, but, you know, I really can't be all that kind to me because, you know, there are bits of me that I don't really like. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I think it's great for just becoming accepting of who you are and all, your, all the good things about you and all the all the not so good things about you because mm -hmm. we're we're imperfect humans yeah. and um, just becoming aware of that. So I think, yeah, for me, for the mindfulness is a really great thing for mental health. And I think the other thing that I would really, um, I think is really important for mental health, and it, it relates actually to mindfulness, is the ability to recognize and accept the different emotions that you have. Um and sometimes those emotions are positive and you like having them. Everybody likes being happy. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes we have emotions that we don't like. Guilt, sadness, shame, anger for some people. And um, and we do things to try not to have those. We try to avoid having those emotions. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's it's okay to have those emotions. Um, um you might, you might want to choose how strongly you experience that emotion because sometimes it's too big and you feel, I can't actually deal with that right now. But, it, but actually having an emotion, whatever that be, positive or negative, is a normal human thing. Uh, and so the more you can get used to having emotions, the better, I think, so that you are, and you can experience them rising and falling. Um, mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah, so, so I, for, for, I think for me, for mental health, it's particularly that sense of, um, non-judgment of compassion and of being able to tolerate different emotions mm -hmm. that's beautiful and I love what you said as well get it a little bit out of the head and go inside of the heart yeah 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 <laughs> what yep. a beautiful thing yeah I, and I think that's a criticism of western societies that we spend a lot of time thinking and doing and that that and that's very valued, and it's important, but mm. but we, we perhaps have overvalued it at the expense of other parts of our lives. And that's going back to Te Whare Tapawha, it's why I think it's such a great model, because it, it really sort of says, actually, all these areas are important in our life. Mental health is important, but so is physical health, so is spiritual health, so are our social relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I like it in terms of the fact that it's that interconnected model, that it's it's a holistic model that says actually we are more than just our thoughts. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and often I think as psychologists we get trapped into talking about just thoughts. Um, yeah. But there's more to it than that. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Another thing I love what you said, you know, it's this definition of no judgmental. Mm, mm-hmm. um, one day I made a little because you know I was listening to this podcast and you know the person was talking about uh, mm-hmm. exactly how how much we judge during the mm, day, you know, mm. constantly and kind of okay, trying to make notes every time you yeah, judge yeah. something. Yeah. Holy, mm-hmm. that's scary. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I did it kind of for half a day. Yeah. Already was enough to see, yeah, yeah. wow, how much yep. I'm constantly judging. Mm-hmm. You know, and we train ourselves to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to to do that all the time. And that's yep. that's not, not a healthy thing at all. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's, it's but it's natural, right? That's how yeah, our yeah. brain works. Our brain works mm-hmm. by making snap judgments about things. And um, so for me, the, the trick is always... It's, it's not that you're going to not going to have judgments, mm-hmm. but it's noticing that they arise and choosing whether you want to act on those judgments or not, or perhaps just noticing that this is a judgment. Mm-hmm. And the metaphor I always like about that is that sense of you are like the sky and judgments and emotions and thoughts are like weather patterns that pass across the sky and they will be different every day sometimes like today it's raining and wet tomorrow it might be sunny unlikely but Mm -hmm. it could be (laughs) um someday it will be sunny Uh you know someday it'll be cloudy Mm -hmm. um but the sky is always the constant but it has these different things coming across it and 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 all these different patterns coming across it and judgments like those they are they are going to always arise Mm -hmm. so um it's, and sometimes people judge themselves about the fact that they've made a judgment. Yes. So now you've got a secondary judgment. Oh, my God, I made this. Oh, he's such an idiot. I, I couldn't w- have. I was doing that a yeah, lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's just a judgment. Yes. So so the acceptance is a go, actually, I made a judgment, and that's how my brain works, and that's how mm. humans work. Um, and And I think there's a fine balance between saying, I accept that this has happened and I like that this has happened and people often confuse those they say oh well i don't like having it and i'm not so, i say well i'm not asking you to like it but just acknowledge that it's happened you don't have liking it's optional mm-hmm. uh, and in fact you know people don't usually like feeling sad or depressed or anxious um so that's that's natural not to like it but but don't confuse liking something with accepting that it's there um oh, wow. you know that's and and that oftentimes i think we our dislike of something let's say an emotion oh, i really hate feeling guilty or no hate feeling angry and so we try to avoid feeling angry but actually the more you try and avoid something the more you get it back so um it's there's the classic experiment that you say to somebody avoid thinking about a pink elephant you know and it's like oh, avoid thinking about what a pink elephant what am i thinking about a pink elephant i'm like oh, i'm thinking about it but i think i said i wasn't going to um so the more you avoid doing something your brain has to keep bringing that to mind so your brain has to keep that alive so that you don't think about it whereas if you go well i'm just aware that it's there and it'll pass um is really it can be a very freeing experience i think um, when people go, oh, you mean I can have an ex- have this emotion? It's not going to overwhelm me. It's not. I'm not going to go crazy because I have this emotion. No, it might be unpleasant while you have it, but you will actually, it'll come and go, mm-hmm. as long as you allow it to come and go. Um, and so I think that's a really, a really useful thing for people to be able to do. It takes time, of course, but yeah. Oh, Dogo, that's that's beautiful. That's really cool. So let's go for the second on the physical well-being. Mm, yeah, well, this is more your area than mine, right? Uh. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, you know, we were, we were when we were talking before. I was just saying about how um, I used. I, I do try to do physical exercise every day, and usually I'm successful. But but I've had to change recently because I, I busted my knees, and my doctor said, mm, I don't think you should be running. Men of your age. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Men of your age shouldn't be running anymore. There's too much pressure on your body, uh. on your knees, on your knee joints. And I said, oh, okay. Um, so I think, you know, whatever your your chosen physical activity is, I think everybody accepts that physical activity is useful, right? And, you know, it's you want to be doing a minimum of 20 minutes or, 30, well, 30 minutes a day, probably, of moderate physical activity where you're sweating. And mm. probably the more you do, the better. Um, and you might say, well, what's psychology got to do with that? Um, and I guess that, that what underpins or what the psycho- psychological component of physical health is forming those habits that get you into regularly doing 
of physical activity. So, so the forming of a habit is a really a psychological thing, but it's a psychological. It's something. So, something as a psychologist, I can contribute to to mental health. I oh, sorry to physical health. Mm-hmm. I can't train you in Brazilian jiu jitsu. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can't train you how to ride, uh, how to swim, but I can help you develop habits that will support you getting into jiu jitsu or that will support you getting into swimming or whatever it is that you do. Mm-hmm. Um, because as psychologists, we know heaps about making uh, making and breaking habits. So um, yeah, the more I think the best thing about physical activity is is or not the best thing, but perhaps a, a a fundamental basis is getting into the habit of it, having a daily routine, um, doing something that you know just getting into that pattern of doing it every day, no matter what. Um, and and so yeah, as as psychologists, we know lots about um, making habits. So I think. But but certainly that, and I I've, I've certainly had the experience that when my physical health is suffering, mm. my mental health starts to suffer as well. So I, uh, again, about Tafari Tapafar, I love the interlinkage between all the different parts. Mm-hmm. Um, and people that have been in lockdown, or, and lots of people around the world still are in lockdown, probably notice that. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, I haven't been able to get out. I haven't been able to do my usual physical activity, and I feel a bit. You know, I feel a bit sort of slothy or I feel a bit lazy or I feel a bit down or I feel a bit just not my usual self. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, it's a, you know, you can see that connection between what you're doing physically and how that affects you mentally and emotionally. So, um, yeah, so I... I, I uh, and I think for me, the, 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 the importance of physical health has grown as I've got older. Mm-hmm. It's like, and when I was young... I, it just sort of happened. You just you were just physically active, and then as I got older, um, got a bit more money and a bit more surplus income, and could drink a better quality of beer. Um, <laughs> then it was sort of you know actually, um, should I go out for a run or should I just stay in and drink beer? <laughs> well, I might just stay in and drink beer. So the, the temptation becomes stronger not to do that. Yeah, yeah. But I think you know the more I've become aware of that, the more I've noticed for me the importance of being able to do something physically active pretty much every day. Mm. And I miss it. I miss it when I don't do it. Mm. Like I, I try to get out and do some physical activity very first thing in the morning, mm. even for half an hour, three quarters of an hour. And I notice that when I don't do that, the daily rhythms of my life get thrown out. Mm. So I, 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 you know, I start the day a bit slothful and I sort of, you know, but it's 12 o'clock and I still feel a bit slow and I don't feel as much as energetic and then I don't concentrate as well and then I feel a bit grumpy at myself because I'm not concentrating as well so it all sort of goes around and and I love how those sort of flows of life sort of intermingle together mm-hmm. physical health's important for your mental health and your mental health's important for your social relationships and your social relationships and you know so it all goes round and round yeah yeah and uh, so, Doug, you you mentioned about making habits. Yeah. So, what what's your your advice for someone who wants to to start improve their their physical well being mm-hmm. and to create it, to make the habit? You know, because that's that's the biggest challenge for for a lot of people. A lot of people. Huh? Yeah, I, I think going right back to where you started that question, the key thing is probably firstly motivation. That we know that um, there's this there's a um, a psychological theory about. Um, uh, uh, the sort of, uh, um, sort of stages of motivation mm-hmm. when you're trying to create a habit. And the very first phase is when you're not even thinking about it. It's just like, oh, I hadn't even thought about it. And then there's then there's what they call contemplation. So I'm just thinking about making a change. It's like, I think I might go for a run. <laughs> okay, cool. That's mm. that's a start. That's And then really what you need to do is probably the next phase to move yourself into the next phase is to prepare for it. Okay, mm. so what am I going to do? Okay, I'm going to – I th- I think jiu-jitsu is the thing for me. I don't know why you'd suddenly think that, but I'm sure people, <laughs> people must do that, right? You know, what yeah. would make you go, well, I could go bike riding or perhaps walking or ju- Brazilian jiu-jitsu is just what I need. Yeah. But So then you do some preparation, right? You go and think, oh, what do I need? Well, I need to find a gym that does it. I need to find an instructor. Mm-hmm. I presume I need some sort of gear. I can't just turn up in jeans and a T-shirt. Mm-hmm. Um, so you start preparing. Um, and then an important part to move you from prepare, pre- preparing to sort of action is thinking about the reasons why you need to do this. What? what why is this important to me? Um, well, because he said that I should do it. Well, 
it's probably not going to happen, is it? The doctor told me to is probably not a strong reason. Mm. So what are the, your internal reasons for wanting to do this, um, which comes back to your motivation? So why am I motivated? What are, the, what are the things that make me say I need to do this or I want to do this? Um, and of course, you might need to try different things. I thought I wanted to go swimming, and then I realised I hated water. Yeah. So I thought, decided that I didn't need to go swimming anymore. But I, so, so then I hit upon Brazilian jiu-jitsu was a thing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you, then, then um, once you've done the preparation to move yourself into action, it's really around. There are some key things that you can do. You can having a, a ritual or a tradition or a, or a routine around it. Mm-hmm. Okay, I always do it at this time. Um, like when I started, first started running a few, or took running back up again a few years ago, mm-hmm. I had the routine of I always got up at the same time and I laid out my, my running gear beforehand so that I didn't have to think too much about it. Because if I stopped and started to think, do I really want to go for a run at 6 o'clock in the morning? The answer was probably going to be no. Yeah. Um, so trying to make as much of it as automatic That's as point, possible. Yeah. I'm just going to do this. Why am I doing it? Oh, just because it's in the diary. Don't think any more about it. Don't think any more about it. Your brain will argue you out of it. So preparing, you know, doing some preparation, some rituals, some routines about it, um, having accountability. So me saying to you, Vanderson, do you know what? I'm going to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu every Wednesday or and Friday. Probably, probably need to do it more than twice a week, right? Or, mm. so twice it's, it's twice is all right. It's okay, a, so I'm going to do it twice a week. <laughs> Wednesdays and Fridays are my day. So having some accountability. Um, and people to do it with can be really useful. Mm. Why don't we sign up to do this together? Yay, that sounds a great idea. And then you hold each other accountable. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and um, having some sort of reward out of it, I know it sounds really simple, but but actually, and, and the reward might be how you feel after you've done the activity, mm. but it might not be because you might feel pretty buggered afterwards and you might be, oh, I'm just exhausted. Yeah. So <laughs> what are you going to do afterwards that... that, that um, that is reinforcing that make that you go. Yeah, I'm doing this because I did that physical activity. So I and you probably don't want it to to counter it. I'm having this great big cream cake because I went for a run. What a reward! Yeah. Probably you, you want to think better about your rewards yeah. than that. But ha- we know that humans respond to rewards. So if you're getting something good out of it, um, uh, then then you will you're more likely to do it again. Um, and the other thing I would say is. Um, um, make yourself the biggest predictor of engaging in a new behavior or a new habit like physical exercise mm-hmm. is hear yourself saying it. Mm-hmm. So if you write it down, writing it down is okay. Hearing yourself saying it is more is the most powerful predictor of what you're going to do. So often if I'm um, working with a client individually, and this might not be about physical health, it might be about something else, I will say to them, what are you going to do this week? Uh, so rather than me say, well, this week I want you to do such and such, what are you going to do this week? We've talked about a whole bunch of things in this past hour. What are you going to do? Mm, um, I love that. Uh, uh, I don't know. I could do such and such. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, as I say, the most powerful predictor of what you will do is is what comes out of your, what you hear yourself say. So if you hear yourself say, do you know what? I'm going to I'm, I'm going to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu twice a week. You're more likely to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu twice a week than if you th- just think it. Mm. So that actually saying it out loud, or at very least writing it down, committing yourself to a goal, mm-hmm. um, and also being human, being um, being forgiving of yourself if you make a little slip up. Oh, I was going to go Monday and Friday, but I missed Friday because it was really wet and raining because we mm. live in Wellington. Um, and and that being okay, going okay. Well, that was just a slip. Doesn't mean I've ruined the whole thing. It's just that slip, and I'll get back on on Monday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. So, guys, say out loud. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yes, at the combat room. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> oh, dog, that's awesome. That's super cool. It's spiritual well being. Mm. I'm mm. super. Yeah, I'm super curious about that as well. Me what's, too. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So look, I'm, I'm. When I think about spiritual in this sense, I, it can mean a whole variety of things, um, and I'm certainly not a religious um, expert, mm-hmm. um, I, you know. And so people, the spiritual, you know, in Māori it's the wairua, which is the, the, the sort of essence that everybody, everything has even. So that could be an organized religion or a set of beliefs. Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism or whatever that may be. 
Um, so, but but we know that actually lots of people don't have an organised set of beliefs, and and they might go, oh, that spirituality stuff's not for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, I, for though particularly for those people, I would say think about what your values are. What we all have values that drive our behaviour. We have certain things that we think are that we hold dear that are really important to us, mm-hmm. and and they will if we let them. Those values can drive our behaviour. Mm. And um, and a really nice way to think about this at the moment is, um, okay, thinking about that we're in lockdown or have just come out of lockdown, how would you like people to think of you or to describe how you were during lockdown? So we think, let's say we're all getting together in 12 months or a year's time and they go, oh, Dougal, I remember in lockdown you were really, whatever it might be, you were really kind you were really, uh, you always had a good sense of humor about you, or you were compassionate, or you were patient, or you were hardworking. Those are all values. And and so um, I encourage people, um, uh, whether or not they have an organized set of, of sort of spiritual or religious beliefs, to think about their values. And their values might be linked to their religion if you have one. You know, if you mm-hmm. believe in a certain way, you will have values that, f- that come, that go together with that. But, but you, you, you don't have to have a, an organized set of beliefs to have values. So think about how you would want people to describe you. And those are probably your values. Mm. Um, now, of course, diff- the same value can give rise to m- very different behaviors. Mm-hmm. So somebody could say, do you know what? I really value, um, I really value my family. They're, they're really important to me. And lots of people will say that. Okay, cool. But one person could have that value, and for them, it means that they spend lots of time at home in the weekends, you know, playing with their kids. Mm. For example, just for example, for somebody else, it might means that they work. They might they might work eighty hours a week, because they're really wanting to make sure that their family are well provided for, Mm. and so they're 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 caring for their family as well. Now, neither of those two are wrong. Neither of those, but they're both right. Mm. So no, I can't. Nobody can tell anybody else what their values are. And nobody can say, um, well, you're, you're, you're doing your values in the wrong way. Yeah. So e- each person will be able to work out their values in their own way. But the key is working out what your values are and then putting that together with a behavior that's consistent with those values. How do I want to be? What do I want to, what would I, a question that I sometimes ask people is saying, okay, if I was a camera on the wall in your house, which is a slightly creepy concept, although <laughs> we're surrounded, of course, by cameras. On, yeah. You know, how many cameras have you, you got in your house? Cameras. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what would I see? How would I see you living out your values? What behaviors would I see? Mm. Okay, if you say, well, for me, a real value is kindness. How do I see that? Where do you show kindness? If, you're, if, you're, um, if one of your values is hard work, do, if I was a camera in your house, do I see you lying in bed all day? Mm. Like, you know, playing a video game. It's like, well, is that? It could be hard work. I don't know. I'm making a judgment there. Uh. But but it doesn't look an awful lot like hard work to me. No. And so sometimes it's noticing, oh, I need, I've got this value and I need a behavior that's connected with that value. And we know that when people are acting or living their lives in accord with their values, they tend to enjoy life better mm-hmm. and they tend to make decisions that they're more comfortable and happier with, even though they're hard decisions. But do you know what? I've got my values. Um, and, and they're going to guide me through. So your values are like your compass in life. Okay, I'm going to keep doing this um, no matter even if it's hard because that's a, that's a real value for me. Um, so they, they help show you where you want to go even when times are tough. Wow, I love that. That's awesome. I love that about the camera. Yeah, you mm, know, yeah. To yeah. Think about it this yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in your case, you could probably use a real yeah. camera. Just have it on your. <laughs> just show it. Just show it around. And say, what do I do all day? And watch it back. But yeah. yeah, for many of us, we don't have that ability. But yeah, thinking about what, how do others see me? How do others? What would they see? Um, what? Because if people don't see the behaviours, then your values are just really things that theoretically exist in your head. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if if I said, oh, for me, val- a value is always being humorous and, and, and good-natured, 
But if most of the time I'm a grumpy old man, it's like going, <laughs> well, that value is not really coming through, is it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so so thinking about how you can actually put those values into action. Mm, and I love what you said about coming from the lockdown, how you yeah. like to people. That's, that's awesome. That's such a good uh, yeah. exercise that you, that you yeah, think yeah. about it. Yeah, and I, th I think often recently talking to lots of people after lockdown or during lockdown, mm -hmm. lots of people have said, oh, actually, there's been some really good things that have come out of lockdown. I have really value being able to have a slower pace of life and work from home for example mm -hmm. and, and I've, we've been saying to people a lot um, uh, actually how what are you going to take what are you going to take from lockdown how can you take that good thing that you've discovered and take it with you it might mean that you have to have a discussion with your boss mm -hmm. oh, I really want to keep working from home at least a couple of days a week I've had that conversation myself mm -hmm. I said I want to work from home some days or some of the days some yeah. days a week uh -huh. um, and because I discovered that in lockdown I never thought I would do it no not me I'd like to keep home and work separate but it was like this is pretty good I mm -hmm. kind of like this it's it's cruisier I like my office mates they're really nice yeah <laughs> um, but I also miss the people the other people mm -hmm. and so I like to have that balance but it's yeah, actually yeah. like and so I've, I've had a conversation with my boss saying can I work at home some of the time some days and my boss is great mm -hmm. um, and she said yes of course you can whatever works for you mm -hmm. um, I appreciate that not everybody will be have nice kind bosses nor they might they might not be in the in the sort of job that you can work from home. If you if you paint houses for a living, you can't really do that from home. It's mm -hmm. sort of difficult. You might have a really nicely painted house, but probably you're not going to make much money out of it because mm -hmm. you need to be painting somebody else's house. Yeah. So um, I appreciate that it can't be for everybody, but think about what your values are mm -hmm. and think about how you can live them out. That's really cool. Yeah, I uh, I often I think a lot about the the you know a definition for a spiritual as well, mm. kind of with uh, spirituality without religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things I always said, and uh, yeah, this this now just gonna add more on my thoughts. But I always mm -hmm. think about the you know kind of spirituality. It's something when I'm I'm part of something that's bigger than than myself. Yeah, you know? yeah. So. For example, and, and this could be anything. So, mm -hmm. for example, I could say, yeah, you know, jiu-jitsu is one of my spiritual practice mm -hmm. because, you know, when I die, jiu-jitsu is still going. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's I'm just a little piece of yeah, this yeah, big yeah. puzzle, yeah, yeah, yeah. or or nature, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you know. So I, I think, it, what, what's your thoughts about? Yeah, it? no, I agree. I think, and I think that's one of the unifying things about different religions is that mm. that sense of you are part there is something bigger than you mm -hmm. um and usually uh, i mean i'm not an expert in world religions but as far as i know most of them sort of have a you you are part of something bigger and good mm. you know and so yeah. you feel connected to something yeah. and whether that's nature oh nature's pretty good we kind of like that yeah. whether it's god <laughs> you know i'm connected to god and and mm -hmm. or i've got part of god within me or i'm part of god and that's pretty good mm. um I think that's a really um, unifying thing about religions is that, um, you know, you, you often people will feel part of something. They'll feel uh, an acceptance. They'll feel that they've got a part to play in something, in a, in a, in a bigger game. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, yeah, I think that's a really useful thing um, for, uh, for people to have that sense of I, I'm bigger, I'm part of something bigger and I matter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, Dougal. That's super cool. So Dougal, now we're going to the to the fourth one, the yep. social social well being. Yeah, social relationships, mm. and and, and pro possibly that's been one of the major areas that gets disrupted with with COVID nineteen, right? It's mm -hmm. like, um, you know, you, we were talking before about you couldn't you couldn't run the combat room, no, because yeah. people couldn't come in. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they could, uh, you know, you could perhaps shadow box on the with each other on Zoom, but <laughs> that's not quite the same. Yeah, and I was suffering a lot. Yeah, 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 for sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. And 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 we know that humans are um, are social creatures, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's been re uh, one thing. One thing I found that was really interesting in lockdown is that, you know, we often we talk about introverts and extroverts and introverts, you know, don't really like being around people. After eight weeks or so, you know, working with organisations through umbrellas, through umbrella, people would often say, do you know what? Uh, so we'd be working with, with team leaders about looking after their team's well-being and we'd talk about, okay, social relations, how are you keeping those going? And 
people would say, do you know what? Even the most introverted people on my team have said, I really miss being around people. <laughs> I want to come back a couple of days a week. So yeah. even the most introverted of us still needs at some level social connection. Mm. Um, and, um, and, and we know that, you know, you get chemical changes from good quality social interactions with people. You get, mm. you get a release of oxytocin. And, yeah. and, and the classic time, you know, you get oxytocin after you've done physical exercise. Mm -hmm. But you've, you do three classic times for oxytocin release are, um, you know, when a baby goes in. Uh, when a baby comes out and when you're breastfeeding a baby, which is largely only women can do that. Mm -hmm. But guys can get involved at least in the first part of that, which is putting the baby in. Mm -hmm. um, so, But those are classic examples yeah. of oxytocin gets released. People feel good. The yeah. other classic example I heard, and, and um, once pe somebody was saying that they said, you know what, I went, to, I, I went to Carter Farms Park in Wales to watch the All Blacks play uh, to play Wales mm -hmm. in rugby. And everybody in the crowd, 40,000 people were singing. And I just felt the, 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 the hairs stand up on my arms and I felt really connected. And it was just, and everybody was smiling. That's probably oxytocin because we're connected together. Mm -hmm. So it's that connection. Yeah. So you, but you, I reckon you'd probably get that through jujitsu. You know, there's a, there is a physical connection, yeah. but you're bonded together. It's mm -hmm. a social bonding. Every day, yeah. Um, so I, th and I, it's really important for our, for how we think about ourselves, for our physical well being. Mm -hmm. Um, and and again, really useful to think about as people are coming out of COVID because they've probably missed or or, or they might be still in COVID wherever. Uh, sorry, in lockdown. Um, so you, wherever you are in the world, you might be at different stages. We're lucky enough to be have be able to meet like this in small yeah. rooms. Mm -hmm. um, some people are not there yet. So mm -hmm. thinking about your social relationships as you emerge from a state of lockdown, and you might want to think actually sit down and sort of draw a little picture of yourself and then draw all the or just write down all the important groups of people around you there's my kids and my partner and my dog and my um, workmates and my friends from this group and my friends from that group my friends from combat room mm -hmm. um, and actually how are those relationships at the moment are they really strong or maybe they're just a little bit lighter because just naturally because I haven't seen them because we were in lockdown mm -hmm. And think about, it's a good time for a stock take. Actually, which relationships are really important? Which give me life? Which give me energy? Because sometimes all of us probably have relationships which don't bring us a lot of energy or life. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, I'm just kind of hanging around with you because that's what we've always done. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying you have to ditch those people or ghost them or anything like that. But it might be that you choose to put your energy somewhere else. And you might go, do you know what? This relationship's really important to me and I've missed it. I want to reinvest in that relationship. And in terms of reinvesting, I'd say to people, look, firstly, you have to prioritize a relationship. You, you know, if you want to have a strong relationship um, with somebody, you need to spend time with them and you need to actually put that ahead of doing other things. Mm -hmm. um, so are you going to go, are you going to watch a movie or, or watch Netflix or are you going to have a conversation with an important person in your life? Um, so prioritizing. Um, you might want to do something new. You've, those of you that have got a that have a partner, um, probably if that you've been with them for a little while, probably have noticed that you can get into a bit of just a rut. Oh, what are you doing? Well, we just we just came home and had dinner, and then watched TV, and then went to bed. Mm. And it's kind of getting a bit boring. Yeah. So, what what can you do that's new and novel, that's both exciting and interesting, and puts a bit of spark in the relationship? Mm -hmm. um, and then the third thing I'd say in terms of uh, in terms of um, um, you know really investing in relationships would be to give you need to give into a relationship and that might be giving tangibly send somebody flowers or buy them a present but it might be giving of you as well you have to give something of you mm -hmm. if I don't tell you or I'm very closed about my myself and don't tell you very many details it's not going to go very far because people go, mm, I can't really get to know them very well and I just mm. don't get a sense of who they are. So you have to give into a relationship. You want to do something new that keeps the relationship alive and vibrant and um, you need to prioritise a relationship. I found the other day, speaking about prioritising relationships, I found the amazing thing. That, did you know you can pause TV and and it sort of st and so when your wife comes in and says how's your day been you don't have to sort of just peer around her going good thank you you can actually pause the TV and go yeah it was and engage for a you know a couple of minutes in a conversation and then press play and it keeps going mm -hmm. it's like oh my god who knew this happened <laughs> so yeah so um so yeah and that's about prioritizing a relationship 
over a TV program. So you, yeah, little yeah. tiny things right. that you can do every day right. just to prioritize a relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, Dogo, that's that's so awesome. Yeah, I knew I had a feeling this is gonna be an, another good episode for the podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah. thank you so much. That's cool. amazing. So, Dogo, tell tell me a little bit more about the. You know, so do, those are the four. So mm-hmm. those are the four. Yeah, yeah. The four pillars. Right? Yeah, yeah. And um, so, what your daily rituals? Mm-hmm. You know, can can you share a little bit sure. about your daily rituals for? Yeah, to so keep those four pillars. Yeah, strong. Yeah. And and look, I'm not holding myself up as a as a as a as a shining exa- as a perfect example. Mm. I think all of us go through different phases of of um, uh, you know in our lives, and sometimes we give more more weight and more emphasis to one of those areas than others. Mm. Um, so for me, I would get up. Um, and almost always, at least during the week, start the day with some sort of physical activity, mm-hmm. whether that's on an exercise bike or doing some yoga or going for a, a sort of a reasonably power walk, not power, power, but, mm-hmm. you know, to get the blood running. And yeah. that might, and so I start the day with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after breakfast, I usually have sort of like a, 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 a prayer and reflection time, maybe 15 or 20 minutes of those. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Um, at some stage during the day, often towards the end of the day, but not always, some stage towards the end of the day, I, I, I like to try and do 15 to 30 minutes of a mindfulness activity. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of taking account of my physical well-being, uh, my mental well-being and my mm-hmm. spiritual well-being. And I think if I'm honest, for me, the, the area that I could do with investing, prioritizing more is, is my relationships. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I'm, I've I've got two kids and I'm married, and but often life just sort of gets into automatic pilot. Mm. Um, you know, my wife comes home and she does her thing, and I do my thing, and mm. we sometimes connect. Um, but maybe I could do better at connecting um, with her, and I think that's something that found over lockdown is there was just felt like more time. Mm-hmm. Ah, just time we could do this together, or we could do that together, or we could just hang out together. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with the return to work, it's been like, oh, well, you know, there's more pressure on it. Mm-hmm. You've got less free time. So yeah. um, so for me, I think relationships are things that probably slip. Um, um, if anything's going to slip, it's going to be relationships because I'll, I'll make sure I do this and I'll make sure I do that and I get very focused at work and make sure I do a good job. Mm-hmm. But the thing that might fall over is relationships. relationships. Um, and so, um, well, in the... In the Past year or so, my wife and I have sort of settled on Wednesday night as our sort of regular date night, mm-hmm. um, to, and so we try to protect that. Um, and it's very rare that we would schedule anything on a Wednesday night, because mm-hmm. so, that's always the time that we go out together right. to try and prioritise that. And if for any reason it's unavoidable, uh, then we would try and, um, you know, and, and rejig that. Okay, I, I can't do date night this week because I've got to get a really important award from the Prime Minister. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just a hint in case she's listening. Um, you know, um, she will. She yeah, will. She, she'll be listening, no doubt. Um, so can we do date night on Thursday instead? Um, but, you know, you, you, you try and keep it there, you try and schedule it and keep it scheduled. So, so for me, I think, yeah, social relationships are probably the things that might slip be the first things to slip. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, if I want my life to be balanced, if I want to be living a really good life, then having those relationships is, is, and, and prioritizing those is, is, is important. It's important. Yeah. That's awesome. So, Dougut, um, you're going you're gonna to uh, host um, a master class in Wellington in September, right? Mm-hmm. I believe so. Managing uh, mental health at the workplace. Yeah. And can you tell a little bit about it? Because now I, I want to be part of this workshop as yeah, well. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so, it, it's, it's so, so that workshop, so that's through Umbrella and that September, is... September, which date of September? Oh, now you've got... I have a feeling it's something like the 16th or the 17th. That's mm-hmm. on the Umbrella website, which is just... Okay, I'm um, going to put on the... the, oh, no, cool. the, the Description, yeah, yeah, so people nice. you know interested can yeah can cool. check it out. So th- this is for people who are um, you know managers or leaders of in organisations, and it's really around how they can um, how they can look after their own mental health, mm-hmm. and then how they can help look after their staff mental health. And 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 saying that we're not saying that people managers or leaders are responsible for for treating their, 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 their team's mental health, but, 
but they actually have a responsibility legally and probably morally um, to be looking after looking out for mm-hmm. is maybe a better term for it looking out for the uh, for the employees mental health so but people often go well, how, how do we do that mm-hmm. well, this seems like oh my god I don't want to do that <laughs> uh, and so we really want to equip people with some the understandings of mental health because yeah. it, often it's a little bit of a black box well we don't really know anything about it so we mm-hmm. want to equip them with an understanding of of what mental health is signs to look out for and then really practical things that they can do to support their people mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and but 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 also to becoming aware of um, of their own well being too because y- you know if you, you need to be aware of your own well being and looking after yourself mm-hmm. in order to look after other people yeah. so um, yeah so that 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 covers two days one day or day one is around your own just general awareness and then two is about how do I look a, a, about others. How do I look at those people that I'm responsible for in the workplace? How do I make sure I'm looking out for their mental health and have some strategies in place for supporting them? Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So, Dougal, um, what, what, what books do you, do you recommend? What's your favorite books? I know that's a, always a hard, a hard question. Hard yeah. I don't know, maybe, yeah, three, four, five books. You... Three, four, or five <laughs> books? Holy moly. Hmm has changed or has inspired you, has given you motivation? Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm hearing you. Um, what, what would I say? I spent, do, do you know what? Mm. This might sound like a dodge, but it's not. I spend an awful lot of time reading novels. Mm. So I don't spend an awful lot of my free time reading psychological texts. But I do when I'm at work, right? I, yeah, I yeah. do, and I do. But I find it really useful to read uh about other people's experiences, mm. um, and and, um, and the same with movies. Mm-hmm. Like so, what, so reading and I, so I, there's a time and a place for sort of you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger shoot 'em up yeah. action movies <laughs> or um, whatever Fast and Furious we're up to now. Mm. Fast and Furious seventeen, yeah. you know, um, whatever it is. So there's a time and a place for those, but there's also a time and a place I think for. Um, for books and movies which which help you understand another person's point of view mm. like um, and I think that's a real richness in 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 arts and literature mm-hmm. is about helping me to understand how somebody else who lives in a different country or from a different way of life thinks and feels and responds. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually encourage my students um, at uni, yes, you need to read all your textbooks and read all your, keep up with articles, mm-hmm. but read um, read fiction right. or, or non-fiction. You know, you could read a biography because they, they're often really enlight- enlightening as well. They just get a bit boring sometimes because yeah, some yeah. people's lives aren't all that great. Yeah. <laughs> and we not, got up today and went to the toilet. You know, yeah. like, mm, we don't really want to care. <laughs> but, you know, re- reading something that, that gives you an insight and understanding and empathy um, for other people, um, because and I think that is a real richness that you can't uh, um, that that you can't get from a textbook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. Mm. So, Dugo, thank you so much for your time. It's cool. a pleasure. I enjoy so yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. It's been great. I love your knowledge, your sense of humor. Yeah, it was cool. was a great episode. Thank cool. you so Thanks, much. Man. It was good to be I here. I hope I hope to to have you again as yeah, a guest in cool. another another episode. So, yeah. thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. It was great. <laughs> Cheers. Awesome. Nice.